All right, welcome everybody to the Leadership Mastermind Podcast. I am your host, Mitch Peak, and this is my co-host, Laura Brandeo. Hello, Laura. Hello, Mitch. I am really looking forward to this episode, and I am privileged and honored to introduce everyone to David Licken. He is a 47-year industry veteran that has been an owner-operator of three mortgage banking companies, a software company, and several leading consulting companies. For the past 20 years, David has been helping companies grow through consulting, executive coaching, and communications. He works with C-level executives and business owners primarily focusing on business strategy, sales and marketing strategy, as well as helping companies create operational efficiencies. Additionally, David is a regular guest on Fox Business News, as well as guest appearances on CNBC. And of course, he currently hosts his own weekly radio podcast, Licking on Lending, that is heard on Mondays at noon central time. He also produces a daily one-minute consumer-facing market commentary video called Today's Mortgage Minute. David, on the Leadership Mastermind podcast, we want to provide our audience with insights and perspectives from our industry experts so we can learn, grow, and be inspired to be a leader to our clients and our teams. Okay, Mitch, let's get started. All right. Welcome, David. It's good to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's a real honor. Yes, I appreciate you joining us. And, uh, I want to welcome you to the show, and then I want to get things started quickly for our audience. So I'm going to uh, ask you the, the big question. What are your top three key pillars to leadership? Well, I think the most important thing in leadership is you got to have a solid why. Simon Sinek is one of my favorite authors, and I think most people struggle with why they are doing what they're doing, especially in the mortgage industry. A lot of people got into the mortgage industry. They fell into it, the happenstance. Not that many chose this industry, which is interesting. And I, and I speak that out to the younger generation that may be listening to this. Do I want to get into mortgage lending? This is a great career, but you need to have a solid why. I got into it because I was getting married for the first time and my went to my dad, I was young, pretty immature, graduated from college and I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. And he said, why don't you go to work for a bank? At least you're gonna learn how to balance your checking account. You struggled with that in college a little bit. So uh, we got we got past that pretty quickly. So I did go to work for a bank and they weren't exactly what sure what to do with me. I have one of those ADHD kind of personalities outgoing and people love me, but I would fail behind the teller counter because they could never get my drawer to balance. I just didn't do that. I didn't do details like that real well. So they were starting up a new mortgage banking division and my why was defined when I made my first mortgage loan. I was young. I don't even know if I was shaving at that point. I would look. I was a very, very young-looking uh, new employee of this bank. And um, but I met this couple, and I said, you know what? I went to the realtor. And I said, you do not have to give me any of your new business. Just give me all your turndowns. Let me prove what I can do on the turndowns, and I can help you. I worked on my first loan. And it hooked me on the mortgage industry, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it for 47 years, as Laura said. So start with a why. That's the first one. The next thing is, as, as a leader, you need to have a clear ability to communicate. And the third one is with clarity. Bring clarity constantly forward. So why is the most important thing? Why are you doing what you need? You have a solid why. And I'll, I can relate that why I was so such a, such a successful originator. Um, then it's ability to communicate because this is a relationship business. And if you have a great why, but you can't communicate it, you're going to fail in leadership at any level, whether it's just being a loan originator and leading the borrower through this process. And then it's the ability to commute with clarity, communicate with clarity. I have a probably a tendency to my natural default is to use abundance of words. And I think the most important thing is bring clarity to have the fewest words possible to nail what you're trying to communicate. Wow, that's great. And those are three absolute amazing pillars of leadership. And I agree with you, David. I think in regards to knowing your why, I think all of us have come into the industry Maybe kind of we fell into it. Maybe we had no other choice, right? Maybe it was one of those situations of, heck, I, you know, the, as good of option as any. And I think you're right. It's not even necessarily how you came in. It's over time your why changes, right? Your why at your beginning stage may be different than your why later. So let me ask you, 
a lot of times in the mortgage industry, it does change. And some people almost get a little burnt out. They get a little, you know, as time changes, it their motivation kind of changes and they forget their why. So how do you recommend people continue to reevaluate that why, especially someone that's been in the industry for 47 years? How do you keep rejuvenating yourself to stay consistent to that changing why? There's numerous ways you can do it. And I've got a great story I'll share with you. And I shared with permission about someone that I helped them uh, and who is just at that place. I've been at that place. And I think for me, I get up early in the morning. I have my quiet time and I do a lot of journaling. And I do this at the beginning of every new year. We're doing this at the beginning of the new year. And uh, I, I go back and establish that. I, I go through this. Why am I doing what I'm doing as a consultant? Why am I doing what I do when I, uh, you know, in, in anything I'm doing in life? I literally have a redefine and reexamine my why statement. And then am I doing a good job of communicating it again and do it if I'm doing so in clarity? So let me give you a real quick story, Laura and Mitch, that I think is really, really interesting. I have a friend of mine. I'll name him. His name is Michael Powell. He is president of, right now, he's president of Simmons Bank's mortgage division. He came to me when he was not there at another place. And he came to me, he says, Dave, described exactly, almost used the words you use, Lori. He says, I'm burned out. I'm thinking about getting out of the industry. And he says, before I do, I thought I'd call you. You've been a client. To, I mean, I've, you've, I've been a client of yours. You've helped me a lot. He said, uh, uh, what's your thoughts? I said, you lost your why. And he yes. Said, and, and I said, here's what I need you to do. I say, I'll accept, I'll, as your coach, accept your resignation from the industry, but not until you've gone to three to five closings. Mm. What I want you to do at each closing is ask the borrower, the consumer, what does this transaction mean to you? Now, listen to this. The first closing he went to, he was slightly late to it, happened to be this top loan officer, walks in there, sitting at the closing table, where a couple. They were signing the last of their documents. And so he apologized for being late, explained while he was there. And then they waited, wait till they finished. He says, I just have a few questions. He says, um, I have a coach kind of, he's instructing me to do this. He says, what does this transaction mean to you? And the gentleman looked at his wife. He says, sir, you don't realize this has saved my life. Oh. He goes, buying a home or this is saved my life. He's and he pushed back from the table and he's in a wheelchair. Oh, it had been, had his legs blown off in, when he was serving in the military. Oh. An idea, one of the mind, blood, my, uh, bombs went off, took off the, took, took the vehicle out, took off his legs. He's a wounded veteran. He got into drinking, got into all the things that unfortunately many of these live with so much pain and they medicate the pain through different means. He says, I bought a bass boat, I bought this, bought this. I destroyed my credit. He says, however, my wife never stopped believing in me. And she found, and he pointed at Michael's loan officer. He says, she started working with us. He says, I believe if we can get qualified for a home, I believe we can save my husband's life. And so the loan officer and the borrower started working together. She says, you're gonna have to have him stop doing this. They got a hold of it. He started thinking maybe just, maybe it's possible. And tears are coming down his face oh. talking about this, about how working with the loan officer, working through the credit, it was a long journey. Sure. And I, I, give, I, I can't remember the name of the loan officer. I've met her in person. Uh, but you look at what you can do. He's, he came out of that meeting. So you need to say, uh, very emotional moment it, and he got back to his car. He says, Lincoln, I'm back. I, I, I'm not getting out of this industry. I found, I, I re-identified my why. And then I said, why did you get in the industry in the first place? He says, ah, oh, that's a great story. And his whole countenance changed. And of he, course. Said, he said, it was, I remember he was one of the ones, Lori, who has intentionally got into it. He said, wow. I remember when my parents bought their first home. And they took me, we went to the closing. They too had had some issues that prevented them. So they didn't tell the kids that they were buying a home until at the closing table. They're at the closing table and they were uh, saying, what are we doing? He says, son, we'll explain it in a minute. They finished closing and they said, we just bought a house. They go, dad, what? You buy what? And so he drove in the car with his parents out to their first house. And he remembers the impact. He remembers the soot of the hot fireplace. He remember entered into it, yeah. walked to his own bedroom. And he loved climbing trees in the backyard where all these climbing trees. He describes the story. And as he told this story, his whole countenance changed. 
And he went and went back. He says, I got into this. It's like epiphany. I got yeah. into it for a really good reason. I said to my dad, how is this possible? And she, he said, we found a loan officer willing to work with us. And so it, it, it identified. So you don't know who, few, what future mortgage bankers you're going to be helping when we go out and help someone obtain home ownership. So I'm, I'm passionate about first-time homeownership. I mean, we're passionate working with all levels of it, but I'm particularly passionate about first-time homeownership. And it is life-changing, that's yeah. for sure. And I do love the advice, David, that you just provided of re-evaluating your why, because you're correct. I mean, especially for us long-time veterans of the industry, we need those reminders. And, really? you know, it's, it, it's interesting. Just this morning, I had a family that a gentleman reached out to me like a year ago that told me he found a property, his dream property. And I think it's in Iowa, believe it or not, Mitch. And he found this property and it's something that we hold the loan. It, it's a loan that's in our portfolio of the property. And he reached out asking, you know, how can I purchase this? And just yesterday they closed on it. And this family actually reached out to me and my portfolio manager, thanking us for changing their lives. And you're correct, David, every day, Things like that are happening. And thank you for sharing that story. That is I, amazing. I think another thing happens is when your heart grows tired or hard, it's hardened to seeing these things. And sometimes when you sit down and start journaling and start considering it, yeah. and you go and meet the people you're talking to. So I, I, I believe this is a relationship driven business, always has been, always will be. I don't care how much technology comes into it. But I think when we have that personal connection, we connect with people, we're going to get a lot of great communication tools. They now are out, Michael's out and he has his team out. They record a lot of the oh. testimonials of what they're doing and they put them on their websites. And so it, what a powerful tool. If you're looking and shopping around for a lender and you go to their website and you hear about all the lives that have been changed, does rate really rank above that? Well, face it, rate, rate is gonna be a pretty important thing. But when it comes down to several lenders that are fairly close, in rate, they're gonna go every time with the one that had the best why and the, the transformation that they had on their lives. Absolutely, I, I love the story. Um, tell us something else that you know people can do like journaling, uh, you know, when they do get lost in, in the business and, and they're looking to redefine their why throughout their career, what, what else can they do? Well, I think you know you have your inner circle of friends. You talk to whether it be your spouse. I think I, I'm a consultant and have been now for 20 years, as you uh, amply said. Um, I always tell all the people that come to me first, it says, I'll take you on as a client, but I first of all want to go talk to your spouse. I want to go out to dinner. And this is back before COVID. Now we do it by Zoom. You know, my wife's in the business. She doesn't work with you. Why would you want to talk to me? I said, because I want to find out if you're listening to the counsel that you're getting from your own spouse. Okay. You won't listen to her, or if it's a female, not listening to your husband, I'm not sure I can help you. Because that is, I think, so I think the thing that starts, Mitch, with the, start with the most important person in your life, your family, a spouse, the parents, brothers, sisters, siblings, those that know you the best. Now you say, well, you come from a dysfunctional family. Okay, then find what's the next group out from that, that really knows you and really knows you. You know what I mean? Has watched you do the pratfalls and makes you, to do all the things that are stupid out there. You, that, you know, whether there's pictures out there, you go like, I hope that never ends up on the internet. Uh, that really, really knows you and seeing you in the big moments and the little moments, the up moments and the and the really disappointing moments and see how you react. And though, that's a great place to start is talking with them. I'm struggling with my why, what do I need to do? Hopefully people will listen to this and they'll, they'll uh, reach out to somebody and, uh, or more importantly, I think what, you guys are doing and anyone listening to this can say, if you're as a salesman or, and you have one of your employees that's struggling, ask them why they got into it. If they don't have a good why, help them find one or it probably may be a good idea to help them move on. Because I think financing as competitive as it is, is we need to have a solid why. You know, I used this why trick when I used to go do loans. I used to come through the loan. I, I had, I did fairly well and I, and I had so many, I took so many applications a day. I did not take applications. I kind of suck at detail. 
And so what I'm, doing, but I'm really good at relationships. I'm good at structuring deals. So I used to set up appointments and I would have an assistant in every driveway before I got there. I call up a setting up an appointment. I said, hey, I'm going to be there. There's going to be someone in sitting in your driveway. Don't be alarmed. They're not stocking your house. Uh, that's going to be my assistant will be joining me. I'll be pulling up at exactly this time. I need to have this ready real good. I walk through the front door and the first question I always asked is, why are you buying this home? Mm -hmm. Because on that, you can anchor all the difficult days that lie ahead. Whether it be another, something on the income that you didn't anticipate, something on the credit board that came up. You anchor people on their why. I tell them, I'm not here to be your friend. I hope we can be friends and you'll refer me to all your friends after this is done, but I'm here to get the results. And I'm gonna know within 15, 20 minutes if this is gonna work, but I first need to know why you're doing this. And that has saved more transactions from flipping out because I come back. Did you not tell me your why is this? This one I'm asking is, is it bigger than your why? Mm -hmm. And it helps people overcome some of those difficult, we, you know the transactions. Oh yeah. They're all out there. <laughs> I mean, everyone's different. So I think it's also applying the same, getting a good why is a good thing to do when you're on the sales side of it is establishing a why and making sure you anchor the buyer on it and then holding them accountable all the way through, which is one of the, if I hit a fourth one is on uh, leadership is accountability, holding people yep. accountable. I think yeah. accountability is probably one of the missing things that may, most people are afraid, especially in the sales management uh, world today. We have so many people getting stolen away from us. Uh, I can't ask, I, I'm not gonna hold them accountable, I might lose them. Well, if you don't hold, you're gonna, if you don't hold people accountable, you're gonna have one of the weakest sales forces out there, or you're gonna have too many in there that are just way below marginal right. level. And so you need to have good accountability. So yes, for three, Mitch, but I'm throwing in a fourth one. <laughs> no, that, that's fantastic. And David, I actually want to ask about, you've referenced a few times now that you're not the master of the details, okay? And I think that's very important and not so much about not being the master of the, the details, but you've recognized your strength yeah. and maybe something that you're not as strong at. And of course, we all have that. We all have those things that we are amazing at and sometimes, especially on the origination side, it's hard for people to recognize, hey, maybe that's not my expertise. So what is some advice in all levels for people to recognize that it's okay for us not to be masters at every single piece of the process and to get people that are great at that so that we can focus on what we're best at? The best way to identify what you're good at is real simple. What gives you life? When you're done doing it, do you feel that, that you feel more alive? Or do you feel like eh, it's something took away from you? That's the number one thing. My love was meeting people. I love the interaction. My idea of a complete 1003, <laughs> <laughs> What's the last name, a scribbled out social security number, the basic stuff. And I threw it in I, to the processing. I said, you figure it out. Finally, my boss is the one that came and really helped me recognize what I want. He says, look at it. Unless you start doing a better job, we're firing you. you <laughs> there you go. Here, but we got to have quality. Oh, come on. You need Bob. We have other people. Then I'll never forget the moment where they came to fire me. And uh, he, the guy, the president of the company was coming to fire me because I just couldn't get, I had dyslexia. I couldn't yeah. add up a column numbers, couldn't get that done right, didn't like details. They tried and they worked with me. And so he came out to fire me. I was a top producer. And <laughs> and uh, he thought he was really conflicted on it. The compliance department is the one. You guys love that. Compliance department gets a hold of someone. They rag on you. Okay, okay. He's a good producer, <laughs> but we got to get rid of him. Got it, got it. He's driving out, so he stopped at a friend of his, happened to be a, a very intelligent guy, had a master's degree, but he loved cars. So he worked in an auto body shop. So he stopped by there, a whole lot of common sense and auto body guys and so uh, and other trades like this. And so he stopped by there. He says, I'm really conflicted. Can I talk to you for a minute? I'm about ready to go fire our top salesperson. He says, you're what? We're going to go fire our top salesperson. Why? He says, he really sucks at detail. We're a bank. We need to make sure that details, done, they matter. Our compliance department is complaining. I mean, we could get written up for some of the stuff. He says, let me see. He's the top producer, right? He sucks at detail. Yeah. What does he suck at? He went through the details. He says, I got your solution. Why don't you buy him a car? Hire, hire him at least one or two assistants and tell him he can never come in the office. He can't do any detail. See right. what happens. And they tore up the check, the severance check. He called in, says, we're keeping him. I got a car which I love. And I got told I never have to go in the office again. I just to go get build relationships. My volume increased. And so sometimes we realize that ourselves. So number one, if you're doing a self analysis, ask yourself, what gives you life and what sucks life out of you? Do what gives you life. Find people that 
what sucks the life out of you, but what is necessary to excellence, find yeah. someone else who's really good at that. That's right. Or partner with them. So anyway, I always got a story. Around and the other, the other thing, David, is kudos to the leader that looked for a way to make that happen. Because just picture that, right? Could you imagine firing your top producer when all you needed to do was figure out a solution to be able to solve for this? So kudos for that. And that is a lesson for every leader out there to recognize that there is, there are ways to make it work. And you can't throw someone away just because they're not good at one section. Find solutions. There's many, many different ways to do this. So love that. Yeah. All right. That kind, of, that kind of brings back to your your second point of communication. You know, they they could have done what they said they were going to do, but the, the guy thought about it, communicated mm -hmm. with his outside sources, yeah, and came up with a solution. So, you know, that brings us to your to your second point. What what are some of your keys to communication in, in your in your leadership? I think people are tired of fake. I think you can uh, tell if you're coming across fakey, that's the number of things. So you need to find your genuine self. What is that? And you need to be comfortable with your genuine self. I mean, I sometimes use a lot of words and I like telling stories as you guys have already seen here. Um, and I think I used to get criticized for that. Get to the point, get to the point. Yeah, I want to get to the point. But when you build a communication or a story or, or trying to get something communicated, if you can create a condensed story down and share it, people will remember the story, which is wrapped around the principle. So I think one of the things is, is when you're working with a borrower, whether you're working with your people, if you wrap what you're trying to get them around to do, whether it be a borrower or staff you're managing, if you communicate some story that they can relate to. So communicate from the heart, find a way that in your voice and your ability by your voice is recognize your personality. I'm a sanguine, outgoing personality. If you're a cleric and you have a very direct style, recognize that and stay within that. Learn how to work with it. If you're an analyst type, you know, a phlegmatic and you're more of the analytical type of person, then learn how to communicate effectively from that place, but do it from that place. And so I, we, we do a lot of consulting in the four personality types. There's the melancholic is the other fourth personality type. Not a lot of those in the mortgage industry. You might see them in, in, uh, in HR or something like that. But we primarily have sanguine, cleric, and phlegmatic in, in the mortgage industry. And it's learning how to communicate to them. It is so key on that. But at first, Mitch, starts with finding your voice. Who are you? Right. Yeah. And I love the idea of the story because... You know, I don't know how everybody else feels, but that's how I am. If I hear a story, you know, then there's a point to the story. I remember the whole thing. But, you know, if you just come after people with just information, um, you know, they're, it's just going to go in one ear and out the other. Yep. That's exactly right. Facts. Facts do not stick. No. A story, no. a story from the heart that touches, pulls on tugs, does something to put a hook into the heart. I'm I'm a, I'm a vocal major of all things. I don't know how I got in the mortgage industry other than I needed a job and I was trying to convince the guy to take me on. It was the same guy that hired me that was going to fire me. And he knew I could be good. And so it, it was one of those stories. So anyway, I was a vocal major, but in music, they teach you what? If you're writing music, create a really good hook. Yeah. When someone hears that little piece that reoccurs, that, re, that uh, runs over and over in the song, they'll hum it. If you have that and they're humming it in the shower, you know you got a great song. So I think we all need to find the hooks that really communicate. And I think that's for us in the mortgage lending, it is having a good story with it. Yeah. And you mentioned being authentic and using your voice. You know, again, being in the mortgage industry a very long time, um, I've seen that evolve. And it's been so wonderful, especially specifically the last five years. Um, I've seen so many people really feel comfortable with being themselves and not being a cookie cutter of everyone else that came before them. So I think we're in a glorious time right now of people really being able to communicate in many different ways. And that leads me to the next question. So David, you are quite the pioneer in podcasting. And I do want to know the story of that's how right. Lickin' on Lending started and why you started a podcast. Yeah, that's a great question. So the truth of the matter is I was, uh, I was being asked to speak on a topic and a particular topic at a conference. And it was a pretty good sized conference, a state convention. I know there's a lot of people there and anytime you get a chance to speak, Laura, you do a lot of public speaking. Yeah. So you understand the value of that audience and the opportunity to present you. And I was talking on a topic that I did not feel as good about. So I went out to start 
it had to be with a compliance item. So I started going out and listed searching. This was now over 10 years ago. And I started searching. My auditory skills are really much stronger than my reading skills because of the dyslexia. It's interesting. The amount of dyslexia in the mortgage industry, especially at the leadership level, if you want to connect mm. with people, that most of them are listeners, not not um, uh, readers. Now, we all have to read. It's part of the deal. But like I've got a Mac, so I highlight and paint over it and hit the speak button. I retain so much more. Yeah. So I wanted to hear some information on this topic I was speaking on. I couldn't find anything. And I go, oh. huh. I wonder if there's not an opportunity. I wonder if others would rather listen to what's going on in the industry. So that was the catalyst of it. So I, I go, but I can't talk about all this stuff. I've got this, <laughs> I've got this area of knowledge I'm really good at, but what about compliance? What about this? What about that? And so I invited Alice Alvey, uh, now at Union Home, come on on. She has been with me for 10 years. I went out to others and said, come on in. Would you participate in this? So that's what launched it. Sometimes it's being an aggregator of information, which is our mm -hmm. podcast more than being the information. And I look right. what you're doing here. You're bringing me on. You have many other wonderful guests. There's two of you, which is really good. So you can play off of each other. So I think it comes down. And then again, the real why is you want to give back. When I realized that there was an opportunity to share information and that others might be interested uh, in listing more than reading, especially if they're wanting to grow in the industry and then tired of reading at the end of the day, this might give them an opportunity while they're driving and to and from work, working out, working in the yard or on the weekends or whatever. So that's how we got started. And oh, I do that's remember, great. I do remember you telling me that, you know, your your main audience loves your your audio of the podcast and that your struggle is, um, you know, to bring them to the video age and, and be able to do both. So are you are you working on that is that something really that really really interesting point and i'm going to go to my website as i do this so i can tell you that we just had on uh two weeks ago last week we had on mike frat and tony uh, this past yeah. Monday, mike frat and tony the chief economist for the nba he did a great job but on december 21st we had as our guest nick Hedges. Nick is the one that started with Leeds 360. He graduated out of Harvard. The investors that put money in Leeds 360 brought him in. You can hear the whole story if you go listen to that podcast. Here's what he said that was so interesting, guys. He says it started with audio. It went to video. But Dave, what we're seeing evidence is because of how busy lives are, it's going back to audio. Ah. Well, anything that you produce on a video basis, like what you're doing here, which is great. Make sure it's done with such quality that you can just strip out the audio and post it out there and your, your audience will go up exponentially. Once they hear you, they go, what does Mitch look like? What does Laura look like? I got to go find out who these people are. And, um, and then, then, then they'll draw them to the video. So audio happens to be still the king or it's come back into vogue is now the king. And I think it's because people, they went, I, I'll, try to watch a YouTube when I'm driving, I confess. I hope my wife's not hearing that. Oh, no. <laughs> I, have, I'm, I swear it's only the, it's the audio I'm listening out of the YouTube. But I think that there, that more and more people just hit a podcast that can play and play and play. So um, I think if you have a solid why as to what you do it, and that is to help people, to educate people. Uh, we do have some advertisers on there because we, and they knocked on my door. Once you have a good enough audience, large enough audience, you've proven, you're proven yourself, then you will have an audience. People start advertising, wanting to advertise because they want to have access to the audience you have. So we do offer some um, uh, sponsorships to the podcast, and uh, it helps you know, cover some of the costs of us doing what we do. We have two full-time people that on, uh, work with us on the podcast, so that's how big it's gotten. Wow, that's great. So I do want to ask you on your consulting side, mm -hmm. you know, obviously 2020, oh boy. I mean, lots and lots of things happened within our industry. Of course, it was very, very good for the mortgage industry and it all turned out okay. Yep. I think when you spoke to us in March, we weren't so sure how it would play out. But what were some of the lessons that you learned with being in the industry in 2020 with your business? Great question. Great question, Laura. Uh, number one is that we can work from home. It's a little bit different yeah. discipline. But I think what most of the industry learned is, wow, we actually can be as productive, if not more productive, by working from home. 
and we seem to have happier employees. Yeah. Now, it's really interesting. We go into 2021. We consult a lot of companies. I'm asking a lot of them, um, how many are, how many of you plan to bring your full team back? And everyone's giving them a chance. And it depends on the range. What's interesting is the millennials and Gen Zers that are in the mortgage industry, we need more of them, uh, want to get back to the office. That's that yeah. social. That, a lot of that's their social. The older group, underwriters have been in the industry for a long time. Probably, they don't want to come back. No. They want to stay at home. Now, it'd be nice to come in for a meeting or something like mm -hmm. that. But we all are learning how to use Zoom effectively. And uh, Zoom or StreamYard or um, yeah, yeah. Teams. Yeah, we use Teams within our company. Mm -hmm. um, all of that is such a powerful tool. You kind of go like, do I really need to go in? So I think we're seeing a transformation. So the key though, is when you start doing this, one of the things we learn is you much have, to, it has to be a little bit more structured and you, when you can get to gather everybody. And, and so there's a whole lot we've learned about how to communicate um, uh, and, and it's communicating with clarity. Today, we're having this meeting. So one of the books I recommend, I think it's really applicable, is Patrick Lencioni's book, The um, Death by Meeting, because it has the four levels of meetings. And if you use that book as a, as a, um, as a template for how to conduct your meetings and step it up just a little bit and be a little more rigid in the Zoom meetings, not that you can't have the, the, the same fun and some of the things going on there, but you need to have some best practices. First of all, when you're at this meeting, uh, you can't have other screens. You cannot be e reading emails. You've got to be present and ten in there. So it's just no different than if you're sitting in a conference room. You cannot, people don't bring their laptops and are reading emails or you, you, you know what response they get if they're sitting here texting while in the middle of a meeting. Laura, you're a good boss. You're not that you're not smiling <laughs> at do it. You yeah. can't do it. So I think we have to set up good contract around that. So if you do the intentionality of setting it up with the proper best practices, uh, I think you're going to find probably 50% of the people are going to stay at home. It could be higher depending on the, the age group uh, that you employ within your company. So I think this that's one of the things we've learned. I think also we've learned that uh, borrowers uh, are much happier when they're wanting to, the, we're finding also the a lot of people want to start online, start the process, but pretty quickly at some point in time, they want to get on and talk to someone. Uh, they're feeling safer, especially if they're really impacted or in a particular state, which really is locked down. Fortunately, we live in Texas, so it's not that so much, but still to be able to meet with a consumer uh, and do so over the phone uh, or over a Zoom meeting or whatever tool they use, I think you actually can do more business. So the second thing is, is we've watched production increase yeah. by those that learn how to use this face-to-face -to -face tool more effectively. Yes. Absolutely. And I think I will be doing my audience or our audience here an injustice by not asking about this story. So uh, mm -hmm. I want to hear more about uh, your, you know, interesting story you have about getting on to uh, Fox News for the first time. Oh, that, <laughs> that is a funny story. So I, um, I was interviewed um, by a reporter uh, uh, who happened to be with American Banker. And, uh, and so uh, they had, I had done a post or something. I can't remember. They picked up on it. So they want, it had to do with the back when the, at the housing or at the, when the last meltdown happened in the mortgage industry. And I had made some comments about Angela Mazzello, the president, the chairman, mm -hmm. founder of Countrywide. Uh, I had been in Southern California, all three of the mortgage companies that uh, I had were all in Southern California. Uh, I've been all over the nation, but that's where they were headquartered. So I got to know Angelo. I got to, and it's interesting that I was, got to know him way, way back at the beginning of my career because he, I bought some loans from he and David Lowe as just a kid and in working through different departments, I had a chance to meet him. I go, man, there's something charismatic about this guy, draws you in. So I got to meet him and see a lot of the leadership. So I actually wrote some positive comments about Angelo when he was getting roasted. Mm -hmm. um, and one of uh, that pub that got published in in um, American Banker, and so I think being quoted is a great thing. You do that, you can write blog posts. That's good. But I think if you hit get with a and someone helping them get um, get known is become friendly. Start communicating with reporters. Uh, especially in the bigger magazines, ones that have the better um, attention. Uh, it's amazing. You can talk to uh, Nick Timros at uh, the Wall Street Journal. He'll take your emails. And he likes what you're saying. He'll, he'll, he may quote you. And if you get quoted, then the networks will pick up on that. So find somebody. If you want to increase your brand, uh, start providing information, even if it's the local television station, the new local newspaper. So that's what I did. So I... <laughs> um, I get this phone call um, and it was 
it was, hey, this is uh, Eric from Fox News. Uh, and I, I'm listening to this. I go, I don't know which one of my friends is trying to play a joke on me, but I don't have time with this. And I hung up, oh. hung up on a producer at Fox. So, and the guy called me, the hair called me back. He's become a good friend. Called me back. He says, this is not a joke. Uh, write this number down and you'll hear me answer Fox News. You have a pen. I go, okay, I'll play with this. And so I wrote down the number and then he says, read it back to me. I read it back to him. He says, now I'm hanging up. He hung up. <laughs> so I go, well, this is interesting. Maybe it's legit. So I dialed it back. He goes, hell, Fox News. Now, do you believe me? And I go, I can't believe it. Why are you calling me? He says, I saw your article. I saw you quoted in about Angel Mazzello, and there's a lot of controversy about this guy. Um, we'd like to have you in and do an interview. So I go, fine. And uh, I said, when? He says, this afternoon. <laughs> it's in the summer in hot Austin. I'm in there, and we're doing I'm – I'm calling on one of my clients that has a very uh, informal – I have shorts on. Mm. And I go, I don't think I'm dressed for the interview. He says, fine, go out get a white shirt, borrow a tie, a shirt, Just ask if you can borrow one. I need you in the studio. So I went into the studio in shorts and flip flops. Oh, wow. Wearing a white shirt and a, a suit jacket. And I sit down and in the chair and uh, uh, they put the little earpiece in. You're standing in front of the camera. It's a dark room. And there's no one there. And uh, he said, the audio comes. Says, this is New York uh, checking you in with audio. And I go, oh, great. How is it? He says, great. Sounds like one, two, three, talk is checking in. He says, okay, now we're going to video check-in. So they run it over to the video guys to check you in. They go, yeah. So uh, and I'm talking to the audio guy for before I say, hey, before you leave, can I ask you a question? Um, can you hear this? He goes, hear what? I said, my heart's beating so hard it's about ready to come out of my chest. I'm concerned that the mic, do we need to move the mic? Because it's it's just going strong. And he goes, that's funny. He says, uh, no, we don't hear it at all. You're fine. You're cool. But don't be nervous. You're only going to be talking about 8 million people alive. And I go, oh, you did not have to say that. So we got checked and went live. And then it, that happened. And afterwards, I go, well, I don't know what I said because I didn't even remember. It was a blur. And the guy that owns the studio handed me his car. He says, I'm going to get to know you a lot. They're going to have you back a lot. So that started. And that's now I've been on well over a hundred times been on that within all the networks. And I think the thing when, when you do that is um, for anyone who gets published and you get an opportunity to get on television, again, just be your genuine self because that's where I was. I just was genuine self, talked about the industry, talked about whatever the issues were, and I was sincere and I spoke both from my heart. And I guess it registered because now that's uh, over 12, 13 years ago and it's been going strong ever since. That's a great story. <laughs> that is a wonderful it's a, story. Yeah, it's and, an amazing story about just, you know, putting yourself out there, you know, like said, just, just, you know, you, you were nervous. You had no idea what you're doing, but you said, you know, here I am. Let's, let's do it. And there's one thing I think is really important. I think I, there's something happened in my life in high school where I was laughed at at a school assembly. And I swore, I took a vow. I will never speak in public again. Really? And I went through college. One of the college classes I had was in Forest City, Iowa, where I was going to Waldorf. And that one of the classes, you had to take a speech class. I'm going, I can't take this. I, 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 I can't. I cannot speak in front of people. He, and he realized it's a certifiable phobia. I said, I actually had a sort of analyze. And I said, I can't speak in front of people. And how we broke that was I was at a conference. And someone had heard me share part of my story. And we go, we got to have this guy up there. They did not tell me in advance that they were having me mm. come up. And they, so it sprung on me and I'm now got enough pride where I can't go, no, 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 I'm not wanting to come up there. So I went up there and something flipped and I changed from that phobia melted away. So I think when people look at whatever your fears or phobias are, you may have your destiny in that because a lot of what I do and what's got me to where I'm at is overcoming that. And now speaking at conferences, having my own podcast, being with you guys and um, getting out there and putting yourself out there. Yeah, there's risk with it. But overcome it. One hundred percent. And and also, David, you mentioned something very key too. A lot of times, especially in our industry, I've seen that people kind of recognize that there's certain people they continually see on stage. There's certain people they see quoted, right? But I think you said something very key. Is that number one? Everyone within our industry has something to say, whether it's your local community, whether it's your local market, whether it's your expertise of whatever it is that you specialize in. Oh, good. Don't be yeah. afraid to share that. 
because it's not something that is exclusive to certain people. We all have something special to share. So don't be afraid to do it. Such good. And I think that goes back to telling the story. You have a story that no one else has. And maybe, and I, I'm being a vocal major, I study voices back early on, and I look at resonance, and I look at how we project our voices. There are some people that are gonna be attracted to your voice, Laura, versus Mitch, or right. both of you, different, because of the frequency at which you speak, the energy at which you speak, the stories you tell. So get out there and realize, that, don't try to copy anybody else. I, all my clients, I tell them, are you copying anybody else? Well, yeah, I really admire this, I'm trying to be this person. Well, stop it. That person's already taken. There is no you. No one else is out there with you. Go out and be you. Yeah, I've, I've noticed in the last five years, Laura, like you said, that, you know, people in general are just more willing to own their story. Yeah. And I think that's very important. People just need to, you know, everybody has a past. Some are some have a great past. Some have a, a rough past. But that rough past is what led them to what they've achieved in their in their greatness. So it's important to own your story. Don't hide it from people because people are going to find it anyway. If you yep. if you put yourself out there, they're going to look you up. They're going to you know find out where you came from and what you've been through. So you might as well own it, put it out there, and, and let people you know learn from it. I couldn't agree with you more. It's great advice. And your future is not written yet, which yep. is the best story that Absolutely. you get. Absolutely. Well, David, this has been amazing. I love your storytelling because as Mitch said, it's very memorable. We can feel it. We can feel it from your heart. And thank you for sharing that because it's certainly you give great, great insights. How can everyone hear more, tune in, all that good stuff? Well, they could go to Lickin' on Lending, L-Y-K-K-E-N on Lending.com. Say so everyone says, what nationality is? It's Norwegian. L-Y-K-K-E means good luck or good fortune. So L-Y-K-K-E-N on lending, lickingonlending.com. Go there. We also have Licking on Leadership. It's another podcast we do where we collect um, leaders in the industry. That's a good one. We're about ready to launch a third podcast, Innovation and Mortgage Lending. Uh, so we, we have, I love communicating out stuff and it's all give back. So that's one place they can go. They can also um, uh, email me. Uh, at david at tms-advisors, uh, O-R-S at the end, tms-advisors, or go on LinkedIn. That's one of the most powerful social media tools for all mortgage professionals, for all professionals. So connect with me there. I love to connect with people on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We're wishing you all the best in 2021. Continue to be out there and keep sharing. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. Blessings and happy new year to everyone of all your listeners. And thank you both for having me on. I'm very honored. Yes, thank you very much for joining us, David. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll look forward to having you on again sometime in the future. Looking forward to it. Thank you. All right. Thank you.